So um, last but not least, we come to Keith Moffat's contribution to the meeting. Um, if I were to read out Keith's long list of awards and honorary degrees, um, it would take several pages of A4, so I'll just give you the executive summary. So Keith is Emeritus Professor of Mathematical Physics at University of Cambridge. He was Director of the Isaac Newton Institute for five years from 1996 to 2001 and has a long-standing association with the International Union of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics, culminating in him being president from 2000 to 2004. He's an FRS and a foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences, USA. And Keith's going to tell us about his friend and colleague, George Benchmer. Thank you, Peter. And it's an honor to come at the end of this program, which I've enjoyed it enormously, as I'm, I'm sure you have also. Wonder, wonderful range of lectures that we've had. Of course, it's a wonderful book. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's really, uh, in a way, a breakthrough. And uh, I congratulate Conrad for having organized this meeting, which has a certain unique flavor to it. We, I, don't, I don't recall any meeting of this kind ever being held before. Well, George Batchelor, this is actually the background to this uh, slide, is a bit of Trinity College, Cambridge, where he spent most of his life. And uh, so, of course, did G.I. Taylor. Um, I've drawn parallels in the past between Batchelor and Stokes, who, whose career was almost exactly 100 years earlier. And you see the parallels. Uh, Stokes was Lucasian professor in, that was the chair of uh, Isaac Newton, so very rightly famous, um, from 1849 to 1897. And just 100 years later, uh, bachelor's career in Cambridge, 1948 to the year 2000, when he sadly died of Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, Bachelor went through the various levels of lecturer, reader, professor, emeritus professor during his time in Cambridge. Stokes was, uh, for a long part of his career, secretary of the Royal Society and editor of the transactions and proceedings of the Royal Society, and he was very, very devoted to that task. He took great personal interest in all the papers that passed through his hands. Similarly, Batchelor edited, well, founded the Journal of Fluid Mechanics in 1956, which of course has had an, an enormous impact and influence on the development of turbulence as a subject. I think the, the vast majority of the papers that have been cited at this meeting uh, and at ETC, I'm sure, uh, on turbulence have been published in, the journal, in this journal, JFM. And he remained founder editor um, until his death in 2000. Both men were what could be described as supremely conscientious with a strong personal commitment to the essential morality of science. And I'll come back to that in Bachelor's case. And both made seminal contributions, of course, to the subject. In Bachelor's case, to the theory of homogeneous turbulence mainly, and later to microhydrodynamics, appropriately the application of Stokes's Low Reynolds number theory to suspensions of particles, drops, or bubbles in fluids. And actually, the very two distinct phases to Bachelor's career, but many of the statistical techniques that he was very familiar with in the context of turbulence, he imported to the theory of microhydrodynamics, which was a subject that he more or less invented. Um, I just show you here the first and last pages of Bachelor's list of publications, and there are um, several pages in between. There were about 130 papers altogether. Um, but you see early papers here starting just uh, towards the end of the war, and these were uh, reports, mainly technical reports, written while he was still in Australia. Um, and uh, leading into early papers, the theory of axisymmetric turbulence here, this is when he had arrived in Cambridge, the double velocity correlation in turbulent flow, a paper in Nature, 1946, and then papers that you may recognize, particularly this 
famous paper on Kolmogorov's theory of locally isotropic turbulence, which really advertised Kolmogorov's theory to the Western world. And it was Batchelor's interpretation and expansion of that theory that's published in this paper. It's worth commenting that Kolmogorov's original papers, there were, I think, three of them in 1941, but uh, each four pages, very compressed, as was the style of Dokladi. Um, and you can see the length of uh, Bachelor's paper here. So it's a considerable discussion and interpretation and very insightful. Whereas if you look at the final page of his publications, it's, um, well, he's, uh, he's very, he's into his, well on in his 70s at this stage, um, but he's still working on diffusion of spheres in a dilute suspension, for example, 50 years with fluid mechanics instability of stratified flow in a vertical cylinder. Now, it's rather interesting. That's a stability problem. Another one here. Expulsion of particles from a buoyant blob in a fluidized bed, and so on, but not turbulence. The last one here, breakup of a falling drop containing dispersed particles, is final paper in, in uh, JFM. I just add, added recently this uh, this uh, final publication in a way. It was around um, 1995 that Batchelor uh, felt that uh, a volume uh, of review, substantial survey papers on fluid mechanics would be justified. And uh, I was drawn into this at a later stage when his health was really seriously failing. Um, but this uh, was published in the year of his death, Bachelor at Moffat and Worcester, sometimes facetiously described as the BMW of fluid mechanics from the initials of the... <laughs> um, well, one of the reviews, one of the reports that I found in a, in a pile of ancient reports from CSIR, uh, it's now CSIRO in Australia, dated 1942, I find to be uh, extremely interesting. It has the title, Note on the Aerial Flight of a Torpedo Bomb. Um, a pair of wings and a tailplane have been developed for a bomb, so that when released at a height of about 70 feet above the water, it will strike the water at some positive angle of incidence. It is assumed from previous full-scale tests that the bomb then bounces off the water due to the hydrodynamic lift created by the wings. And then the paper is actually a fairly elementary discussion of the dynamics uh, as a problem in rigid body dynamics subject to aerodynamic uh, lift and drag. Um, well, I think I'm sure you're all familiar with the film, The Dam Busters. This uh, describes a famous operation, Operation chastise, as it was uh, described in those days, an attack on the German dams carried out in May 1943 by Royal Air Force No. 617 Squadron, subsequently known as the Dam Busters, using a specially developed bouncing bomb invented and developed by Barnes Wallace, a very, very famous event uh, during the war. Um, well, I just find this extremely interesting that here was Bachelor in Australia assigned to work on this problem. And I don't know any more about it than that. I don't know if there was, I, th I doubt that there was any communication between Australia and, well, there could have been, I suppose, telephone or coded communication um, between uh, Australia and the UK at that time during that development. Well, here's the background. GKB, as he was often called, George Keith Batchelor, born in Melbourne in 1920. We've seen, uh, the, I was delighted to see that uh, picture of the house or the street where he was born. Um, schooled in Melbourne, won a scholarship to Melbourne University, very much a Melbourne boy, graduating in maths and physics, 1939, just as World War II broke out. It had been his ambition to go straight to Cambridge to work with G.I. Taylor. He already had that. It was his ambition. Um, but war broke out, and that was to delay his, his, uh, <laughs> the realization of this ambition for some years. Um, so his research in aerodynamics with CSIR throughout the war, he recognized during that time turbulence as a key problem and studied the papers of G.I. Taylor, particularly the great series of papers in 1935 on the statistics of uh, turbulence, the definition of 
homogeneous and isotropic turbulence and so on. Uh, he applied to Cambridge to work with GI, persuaded his fellow Australian, as we've heard, Alan Townsend, to join him in turbulence research. It was a brilliant combination of theory on the bachelor side and experiment on the Townsend side, a wonderful combination. Uh, George married Wilma Reitz in 1944, and they both set off for England in January 1945 by sea voyage. So this was before the end of the war. Um, a voyage that took 10 weeks via New Zealand, Panama, Jamaica, New York, and then in a convoy of 90 ships across the Atlantic, arriving Tilbury Docks in London in April 1945. This was, in fact, the ship in which they sailed. Uh, and uh, later a picture of it, SS Ungeni, around 1950. Well, the surprise, of course, when they met G.I. Taylor was to discover that he had lost interest in turbulence, essentially. And he didn't want to. He was interested in other things, for example, uh, the dynamics of explosions. He'd just been involved in the, uh, in the, develop in the atomic bomb. Uh, and uh, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the manner of expansion of a mushroom cloud from a re release of energy uh, was one of the things he'd been working on. And um, similarly, the rise of large bubbles in the, in the ocean, again, from underwater explosions, problems of that kind on which he'd obviously been working during the war. And he uh, wanted to continue to work on these uh, problems um, uh, in the years following the war. But anyway, Batcher and Townsend didn't mind. They had their ideas. They wanted to get on with it, experiment and the development of the theory. This is a photograph of the uh, research personnel in the Cavendish lab in 1945. And you can see Batchelor here and Townsend here. This is Sir Lawrence Bragg, who was uh, chairman uh, or head of the department at that time. We have all the names of these people. I just remark on a certain problem of gender balance. <laughs> the girls are here. There are actually two more senior ladies here, but still there is a little bit of a... One in the very middle. <laughs> and one in the middle, perhaps. Uh, yes. All right. Next to Taylor. Well, it's a decent percentage. Here is, here is uh, Sir Geoffrey Taylor. Oh, yes, this is the, the lady here, yes. Yes, um, who is A.C. Horton and then Lawrence Bragg. Well, um, April 1945. Batchelor set to work in the basement library of the Cambridge Philosophical Society, which was where the science books of the university library were stocked. And he later described how he came upon the papers of Kolmogorov. 1941, like a prospector, systematically going through a load of crushed rock, I suddenly came across two short articles, each of about four pages in length, whose quality was immediately clear. Now, the crushed rock is interesting because I suspect that he looked at all, every paper with the word turbulence in the title or treating turbulence, and a lot of it was, uh, I think, in his view, not worth reading. Um, but he recognized immediately the uh, quality of these papers of Kolmogorov. Uh, this is something he said much later in uh, 1992, one of his uh, later lectures. It's very interesting how the, the Delclady got uh, to the library in Cambridge here, having produce, been produced presumably in Moscow or perhaps in Kazan, uh, during these dreadful wartime years. And Baranblatt, in fact, recounts that um, they were used, because large uh, stocks of these volumes, used as ballast for the ships um, returning from Murmansk, which is around here, the Northern Soviet Union returning around this uh, very uh, turbulent ocean uh, to uh, ports in the United Kingdom during the war, ballast in ships on their return voyage, having carried armaments for besieged Russian cities on the outward voyage. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, it seems quite plausible. It's hard to, uh, to, to understand how these uh, volumes could have got to 
the United Kingdom, been there in the library, in the basement, catalogued. There was no other route. At the time, no other there was no other route. It had to be right. It had to be it's true. Submarine infested, not only the world. <laughs> Good. Well, Batchelor presented his interpretation of Kolmogorov's work and comparison with that of Onsager, Heisenberg, and von Weisecker. Of course, he didn't know about the work of Prantl. Um, at the Paris International Congress of Mechanics in September 1946. I just comment that the proceedings of this Congress, were, uh, this was told to me by Paul Germain, were duly, he, he was the young secretary of the Congress, delivered to Gautier Villard, but have not yet appeared. <laughs> A record in publication delayed. <laughs> but um, George published he, his paper in Nature anyway, a short paper, and the full account in the Proceedings of the Cambridge Philosophical Library, uh, Society very appropriately um, one year later. I'll just show you this uh, opening page and then one of the pages of that paper, Kolmogorov's Theory. And I draw your attention to this fact here that Batchelor does discuss um, and recognizes the importance of this four fifths law that we've heard quite a lot about. He discusses the four fifths law here, but curiously, not in his 1953 book. I don't know why he chose to omit it there, uh, but he was certainly aware of it. And uh, it's a result that was described by Uriel Frisch in his book as uh, both exact and non-trivial. And I mean, a, fully, a result associated with the full dynamics of the Navier-Stokes equations and uh, therefore very significant. Well, uh, George, uh, this here's a picture of uh, George Batchelor, a young man. In fact, I think this was on his graduation day when he took his PhD degree in 1948 with uh, G.I. Taylor, his supervisor. And I think this quote is interesting from the preface of his PhD thesis because many people are uh, curious about the relationship between Batchelor and Taylor. And this gives some indication, speaking for the moment of the work as a whole, he means his PhD thesis, I should like to pay tribute to the wise counsels of my mentor, Sir Geoffrey Taylor. It is impossible to say how much of the work which I claim as original has been evolved as a result of stimulation provided by contact with him. His assistance has not been in detail, but if, as I believe, I have used a fruitful and realistic approach to the problem of turbulence, it is largely due to the influence of his published work and his verbal discussion. In general, this dissertation represents superstructure built on his foundation work on the use of statistical theory and the significance of isotropic turbulence. Well, Batchelor had been elected a research fellow at Trinity one year earlier, again, like Safman, uh, uh, after two years of research on turbulence, and the PhD took the full three years. This actually is a page of notes from Batchelor's uh, notebook that he kept in around that time. I think this is around 1947. And uh, it's uh, suggestions for exploitation of Kolmog's, uh, abbreviated Kolmogorov's theory of local isotropy. And he lists one, two, three, this goes on for several pages of uh, his notes, uh, ideas for future work. And some of these ideas were duly implemented. And uh, here's one of the later papers, again, it's been cited quite frequently at this meeting, a Bachelor and Townsend, 1949, The Nature of Turbulent Motion at Large Wave Numbers, in which um, I, I've said the first mention of intermittency. I think I was wrong there because it seems Townsend certainly mentioned intermittency the year before, um, 1947. But this was the paper in which um, they noted the problem of the flattening factors of velocity derivatives at, um, for example, this is dNu by dx to the n. And n is 1, 2, and 3 here, uh, normalized by the, uh, uh, the, the, the root, the square, uh, you see. So this is the fourth power here. This is the square, average, and then squared. So a dimensionless number, which on Kolmogorov's theory ought to be a universal constant. For each n, it should be a constant. Well, it clearly uh, isn't. For each n, it is an increasing function of Reynolds' number. Um, and so there was an indication here already of a problem with Kolmogorov's theory, which uh, with K41. Uh, I don't think they, 
it didn't in any way shatter at that stage Bachelor's uh, belief or reliance, or, and Townsend's, on Kolmogorov's theory, but it's just somehow they were aware that there was a serious difficulty, which I'll come back to. I want to draw attention to this paper also um, on the spontaneous magnetic field in a conducting liquid in turbulent motion. Uh, this was 1950, and it's the paper in which he introduced the, or discussed, the analogy between vorticity and magnetic field. You see it here. It is shown that the equations for the magnetic field is identical in form, the equation, with that for the vorticity in a known conducting fluid. Bachelor made a great deal of this analogy, some justified and some, as it turned out later, unjustified. The analogy is not perfect. Said here, some valid results do follow from the analogy. For example, in the ideal fluid limit, magnetic flux is conserved through any moving circuit, like flux of vorticity in an inviscid non-conducting fluid. So you can get so far, but you can't push this analogy too far. Um, I'm sorry, this uh, hasn't gone out too well. So I don't, th well, I, I will mention it. It was um, the proceedings of a meeting a year earlier. It was um, a symposium that was concerned with magnetohydrodynamics. And um, a bachelor got up to speak, and his paper published in the proceedings reads this. It is not a very enviable task to follow Dr. von Karman on this subject of turbulence. He explained things so very clearly, and he has touched on so many matters, that the list of things which I had to say is now torn to shreds by the crossings out I have had to make <laughs> as his talk progressed. But there's one point on uh, what ought to be called the pure turbulence theory, which I should like to make. This point concerns the spectrum and will be useful also for Don, uh, Dr. von uh, Weisseker in his talk. After having made that point, I want to plunge straight into the subject that some of the speakers have lightly touched on and then hastily passed on from, namely the interaction between the magnetic field and the turbulence. That will perhaps give us something to talk about. I shall be thinking aloud so that everything may be questioned. Well, I've said, this was actually something I wrote uh, some years ago. Um, it takes some courage to think aloud in an international gathering of this kind. And here was Bachelor at the age of 29, thinking al aloud and indeed leading the debate in the presence of such giants as von Karman, von, Neu von Neumann, who was also at this meeting, and uh, von Weisecker. Amazing. When we think nowadays of our graduate students, often still at the age of uh, 29, Bachelor was ex incredibly confident uh, already at this early stage of his career. Um, this was a picture that you haven't seen, I think, but the small turbulence research group around 1952, Bachelor and GI. I mean, GI did condescend to sit in the turbulence research group, although he wasn't, well, I don't know, he was returning. He, uh, in, in 1953, GI published his paper on dispersion of a solute in a pipe, and he did consider the laminar and turbulent effects in, in that paper. So he wasn't entirely divorced from turbulence. Uh, this is Ian Proudman, young colleague of Bachelor. This is Tom Ellison, and this is Bill Reed, who was visiting, who was doing his PhD in Cambridge at that time. Reed and Proudman wrote a very extensive paper on the quasi-normal approximation in uh, the mid-1950s, as did Tomomasa Tatsumi, who is here, uh, that paper in, I think it was 1957. So that was a theory that was very much under development. Now this is uh, Bachelor's famous research monograph published in 1953, and um, his philosophy is set out in the preface here. Um, finally, he says, it may be worthwhile to say a word about the attitude that I have adopted to the problem of turbulent motion, since workers in the field range over the whole spectrum from the purest of pure mathematicians to the most cautious of experimenters. It is my belief that applied mathematics or theoretical physics is a science in its own right and is neither a watered down version of pure mathematics nor a prim form of physics. The problem of turbulence falls within the province of this subject. 
since it is capable of being formulated precisely. The manner of presentation of the material in this book has been chosen not with an eye to the needs of mathematicians or physicists or any other class of people, but according to what is best suited, in my opinion, to the task of understanding the phenomenon. Where mathematical analysis contributes to that end, I have used it as fully as I have been able. And equally, I have not hesitated to talk in descriptive physical terms where mathematics seems to hinder the understanding. Such a plan will not suit everybody's taste, but it is consistent with my view of the nature of the subject matter. That tells us quite a lot about George Batchelor's approach, not only to turbulence, but to fluid mechanics generally. And I draw your attention also to this last page of the text of the book, um, the last little paragraph you can see here. But this last page of the book, as Uriel has told us this morning, discusses 2D turbulence. A bachelor shows in this paragraph here that conservation of entropy implies that energy must flow preferentially towards small wave numbers, that's large length scales. So he's anticipating the inverse cascade, although certainly he doesn't use this uh, terminology. He concludes here that there will gradually emerge a few strong isolated vortices and vortices of the same sign will continue to tend to group together. And he refers to Ansager's work in 1949. So he was aware of this, and of course this was uh, confirmed by McWilliams in 1984 by DNS of 2 the emergence of isolated coherent vortices in turbulent flow. Uh, this was, uh, well, Batchelor returned to this um, in the 1960s, my belief that he must have discussed 2D turbulence with Kraken at uh, the Marseille meeting in 1961. Um, anyway, it was shortly after that the deep rooted student Roger Bray to work on the uh, numerical simulation, a first uh, attempt at numerical simulation using a spectral technique of 2D turbulence. And that's what Bray got his uh, PhD thesis on, a thesis, uh, work that was never published. But Batchelor in 1969, two years after Craikman's paper, published his version and referred very much to the work of Bray, R. W. Bray, you see here, in having been his student. And I just draw attention, the existence of a cascade of mean square vorticity, this is the entropy cascade that he is concerned with, consistent with the development of the expected, the expected k to the minus one form of the vorticity spectrum, or k to the minus three for energy spectrum that uh, Dale Poulin mentioned in the previous lecture. Well, you've seen this picture uh, several times. I just draw attention once again to Safman as a research student at this time in the back row. Um, bachelor here, uh, Townsend, and um, Owen Phillips behind Bachelor, and uh, Milton Van Dyke, who was a visitor to uh, Cambridge during that year. There were always a number of visitors to, turbulent, uh, to, to the group. It was still in the Cavendish Laboratory in 1954, but it was largely Bachelor at that, by this stage, who was building things up. This is a rather nice picture of Bachelor taken by Chia Shen Yi, who was another visitor uh, I think it was about 1959. Um, he's wearing a green jacket. The picture doesn't come out well on this screen, but uh, that was a jacket that he was still wearing 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bachelor in his office at the old Cavendish Laboratory in, in November 1956. He's now 36 years old. He has just founded this year the Journal of Fluid Mechanics, so I think he's quite pleased with his achievement and he's probably phoning his associate editors um, and uh, he has also in that year just been elected fellow of the Royal Society and this is the official photograph that was taken. This was 1956 uh, at the Brussels Congress of Applied Mechanics. Uh, bachelor again here. I don't know who these uh, other individuals but I think they're officials in Brussels, but on the right here is uh, James Lighthill. And this is rather interesting. It's the only photograph I have that contains both Bachelor and Lighthill together. 
Um, they were both dominant figures in fluid mechanics in, in the UK and I think really internationally, but I said poles apart in personality and style. Whitehill came to Cambridge, um, he held the, he was also Trinity College, um, so he was known to Bachelor from very early days, but uh, and Bachelor attracted him back to the Lucasian chair uh, on the retirement of Paul Dirac. Uh, in DAMTP, our department, from 1969 to 1978. And it was during that time that there was a sort of period of great creative tension between, between Bachelor and Lighthill. Totally different in style. Bachelor rather controlled and uh, thoughtful. And if, he, if you had a conversation with him, he gave you his complete attention. Totally focused. Lighthill was an ebullient personality. If he was lecturing, he would be uh, leaping about on the stage. In that period he was very much into biological fluid mechanics and when he lectured on bird flight for example he would actually act the part. He would more, in his enthusiasm he would almost take flight himself from the stage. He was dancing. The stage. <laughs> yes, he was dancing. So they couldn't have been more different and yet uh, in fact they had a very very good relationship. This uh, was another picture from the same Congress, and Bachelor is in some rather distinguished group. I recognize Sedov here, who was the chief uh, delegate from the Soviet. Uh, I don't, but I do, don't, maybe some of you may be able to help me to identify some of the others in this picture. Now, Bachelor 1959, he came to the problem of the passive scalar, and um, this was uh, his major paper on this topic. We've heard about uh, the Corson and Obukov uh, papers which gave the minus five-thirds slope in a certain range and I probably identified the, the, the cutoff. But Bachelor's achievement in this very long paper, and you see even the length of the, the, length of the abstract, he wrote long abstracts <laughs> and the paper uh, was long in proportion to the length of the abstract. Um, his achievement here was to find um, uh, the range that is a minus one range, rather interesting, minus five thirds here, minus one range, and it can be a long range. He called this the, uh, uh, I can't remember the, con uh, the conductive uh, range beyond the, the Kolmogorov cutoff and down to a conduction cutoff at epsilon over nu kappa squared to the power one quarter where kappa is the diffusivity of the passive scalar. Well that was a very substantial paper and there was a second paper by Bachelor, Howells and Townsend which considered a different regime where the, the two uh, cutoffs changed places as it were. It's a question of Prandtl number, this is new much less than kappa. So the conduction cutoff is now here. And uh, this is the minus 17 thirds slope that was found in this paper. Minus 17 thirds. <laughs> <laughs> Another third, uh, Obukov's law. Um, Howell's is interesting <coughs> character. He was a research fellow of Trinity College at the time. He left later and became a Jesuit priest back in his home country of Australia. Now I've referred in previous publications to what I regard as the watershed of the Marseille meeting, the famous Marseille meeting. Uh, and watershed, I use this word uh, with its meaning of a crucial point or dividing line between two phases, conditions, so on. A watershed. These are two photographs, the only two photographs that I have from that Marseille meeting. Uh, this was a colloque international du CNRS to mark the opening of the Institut Statistique de la Turbulence exactly 50 years ago. The Institut sadly did not last the 50 years, but the anniversary of the colloquium will be marked by a repeat colloquium in Marseille later this month. Um, and. Uh, uh, well, I can identify a few of the people here. Here's G.I. Taylor, and here is Kovazny, and here I think is Kovazny's wife. She was a very charming lady, and here is George, bachelor, doing his best to charm Mrs. Kovazny. And uh, you see Tani over here from Japan, and I think um, this is Don Coles and Mark Morkovin, and so on. 
I'm at the next table. This was obviously the, the high table. <laughs> and from, I don't think I can see Kolmogorov, although he just may be somewhere. And this was an outing that we, an excursion to the Roman ruins at Arles um, during the... This is a picture of um, a bachelor with von Karman, you see. Um, and uh, I th I'm not sure whether it was at the Marseille meeting or it could have been the previous year at the Congress in Streza. But anyway, if it was at Streza, they were discussing and they were already planning the, or Bachelor was probably inviting Carman to come to the Marseille meeting. Well, I said the theory of turbulence and Bachelor's own career reached a, a crisis point at this meeting. Um, Craigland's theory, as we've heard, the direct uh, interaction approximation, had been published two years earlier, two or three. It was presented by Craigland at the meeting in comparison with other theories like quasi-normal approximation. It was then subjected to intense criticism by Ian Proudman. You can see the proceedings. Batchelor never came to terms with this, I've called this mystifying theory. He couldn't understand it. It led to the k to the minus three half spectrum, of, as we've uh, heard in contrast to the k to the minus five thirds. And Batchelor, I believe, became progressively disillusioned with turbulence during the 1960s. At any rate, whatever the reason, he turned his attention to the development of DAMTP, the department that he had founded, he was the head of this department, and to his book, An Introduction to Fluid Dynamics, which was published in 1967, and to the foundation of Euromec, which I uh, mentioned the other day in my speech. I won't say anything about this here, except to point out that we wouldn't really be here if uh, Euromec hadn't been founded back in the 1960s. And um, uh, Batchelor was a key player in that development. Um, I don't know that I have time, because time is running on too rapidly, so I won't uh, go through this, his concluding remarks at the Marseille Colloquium, but you can see the, the, the this uh, proceedings of that colloquium will be on the web, there is, is on the web, but I don't know if it's already accessible. But you'll be able to read his conclusions, and I do uh, suggest that, that you go to this. Uh, there was one thing I want to mention quickly. Um, September 1963, there was a meeting in Zakopane, here in Poland, in the Tatra Mountains, and a bachelor presented a paper at that meeting on the dispersion, it was in turbulence, dispersion of a pollutant released on the ground in a turbulent wind, a turbulent boundary layer. And I was very much reminded of this by uh, this unpronounceable volcano in, uh, well, I can pronounce it. I don't know if anyone else can. Eyef Yalayokur is the pronunciation that I prefer. Um, last year in uh, Iceland. Um, and this was a picture from the Times a day or two later, the spread of the cloud, the spread of the cloud over Europe, extending almost as far as Moscow on the right and certainly down over, over uh, Fran uh, France, down into Spain, well, all over here. Certainly covered the whole of the United Kingdom. And um, this was just the sort of situation that, that Batchelor had been concerned with, the dispersion from a point source um, in a turbulent wind which was unfortunately blowing all over Europe. Um, this was a quote from Bachelor's 1964. It was published, the paper. I like to think that this, uh, this is from the Times. It, for me, has the shape of a kangaroo. And I regarded this as the spirit of Bachelor <laughs> hovering, <laughs> hovering over Europe one year, 10 years after his death. Oh, it can also be interpreted as Iceland's revenge for the financial <laughs> collapse of the Icelandic banks. That is Batchelor taking his book, 1966, to the press, The Introduction to Fluid Mechanics. This is his 70th birthday party, and rather nostalgic occasion. I think he was already beginning to uh, have the symptoms of Parkinson's. But you see here... Um, the th three of the people, well, Safman here on the right, Van Dyke, who was in that picture, and uh, Owen Phillips, the three who were in the picture from the 1950s, and then others, Brooke Benjamin, Yaglom, Andy Akravos, who's still going strong, Baron Blatt, who's still going strong in Berkeley, myself, 
uh, and uh, then Van Dyck, as I say, who was visiting, and uh, we had a very good two-day meeting. He'll be remembered as a man of great scientific integrity, penetrating judgment, deeply held convictions. He wrote this la quote here. Have I time to read it? Yes. yes. Through having common objectives. This is Bachelor's writing, 1997. And principles by which new knowledge is assessed and disseminated. Scientists concerned with a particular field like fluid mechanics form an international community of great unity and moral strength. I believe that the understanding, trust, and goodwill between members of this scientific community transcends geographical and political boundaries and constitutes one of the most important forces for international harmony and friendship in the world today. Now, that's Bachelor's philosophy. Two things I just have to finish with. Um, this is a picture of him with his Polish colleague, a very poor reproduction, I'm sorry about that, with Richard Herczynski and Vladek Fizdun. But on one of his visits to Poland, and there were many, Bachelor recognized the potential of a young student named Conrad Bayer and persuaded him to apply to Trinity College, Cambridge, to undertake PhD research. And I was the fortunate supervisor of this multi-talented student. And here we are celebrating some years later. Thank you, Conrad for having arranged this meeting on top of the heavy responsibility of organizing the ETC and uh, for having done so <coughs> with great tact, efficiency, and good humor. <laughs> so thank you for that wonderful talk. We have plenty of time for questions. Uriel. Uh, yes, uh, Keith touched on the interesting uh, issue of uh, what the results obtained uh, with Townsend on intermittency uh, implied for the validity or not of the Kolmogorov theory. Uh, I had a discussion with Townsend uh, about 20 years ago or so, uh, where Townsend say, told me that he and George didn't agree on what it implied, that uh, Townsend uh, thought that it was contradicting the Kolmogorov theory and George not. Mm. Uh, and of course, one might conclude uh, from all the results on intermittency that it did, but that's not true. Actually, George was right. And this was pointed out by Kreiknan himself when he developed his theory of dissipation range intermittency. He was carefully pointed out that it does not imply the lack of validity, the possible, lack, the possible validity of the Kolmogorov theory at inertial range scale, because it applies to different kinds of scales. Mm. Well, I think that's true. I, I think they, they, they hadn't come to firm conclusions, and I think they left questions open, and they continued to brood about these problems through the, through the 1950s. And things, in a way, came to a head at the Marseille meeting. Uh, it all sort of erupted there. But I didn't have time to uh, develop that, but I will in Marseille in a, in a week's time. I think you mentioned it one point that uh, George Batchelor was pessimistic about advances in theory and I wondered if he held, uh, do you know of any views he held about the potential for computational fluid dynamics in uh, turbulence? Yes, I think that's very interesting. Um, the very fact that he put his student Roger Bray onto 2D turbulence, I mean it was very low resolution, it was the best you could do in the 1960s, but I think that indicated that he was, he was open to the possibilities. I, uh, I think his, his personal preference was always towards physical argument, things a bit like Safman that he had a, some feeling for and certainly he was um, reluctant to get in deeply into any sophisticated mathematical theory that didn't have a good physical basis. Um, but on numerics, I think he kept an open mind. And in his later papers in the, uh, 
in the 90s in collaboration with people like Chasanoff. He, he did at that stage certainly recognize the power of computation. Any other questions? It's a rather remark. I think it's very clearly shown how Marseille meeting was absolutely critical point. And in a sense, to oversimplify it greatly, it's a crisis between a structural, physical view of turbulence and statistical kind of, you know, formalism driven. And in this respect, we still did not reach yet this, we did not resolve this contradiction. And in my view, the only way forward is really to make a synthesis. And so, because when we look around, for example, in, in, in condensed matter and field theory, it is precisely the physical insight, sometimes of topological nature of you, sometimes just understanding what actually moves which way, incorporated into powerful yes. field theoretical formalism. To an extent, zero mode 90s was a trivial example of it, but something really synthetic like this, that's the way to move turbulence. It's doable, it's just very, very technically. So I understand frustration of Bachelor and Sachman on one hand, on the other hand, I understand Kraiknan, and that some synthesis is definitely possible, but not necessarily of a grand scheme, just case by case. Yes, I believe myself that we, we have to understand the elementary interactions of vortices, which are nonlinear in character, and understand once we have a good understanding of that, which we don't actually have yet, it's amazing, but once we have that, that to build that into the statistics is, is the next step. Okay, perhaps yeah. one more question. Yeah. The back. So, so what was Bachelor's motivation for creating damped uh, interdisciplinary unit? Uh? I think he, he um, if you know Cambridge, in the days before damped, the research students were scattered around uh, the different colleges. And there was no sort of building, a focus building, where they could interact on a regular day-to-day -day basis with the, um, with the teachers. Um, and. Uh, he, well, there was the Cavendish Laboratory, of course, but I think that um, he was, Bachelor was actually a member of the mathematics faculty, and he was given an office in the Cavendish Laboratory by just um, courtesy. They, uh, they allowed him an office, but the research students did not have uh, rooms. And so I think it was an act of philanthropy on the, on the for he saw the need for um, uh, what you might describe as an institute, a research uh, institute within the university where the research students could uh, interact and have a life. Okay, thank you. Any final pressing questions? Oh. A damned good idea. A damned good <laughs> idea. Well, I'm, I was one of the first uh, beneficiaries. I became a research student in uh, of Bachelor in 1958, um, and that was just, uh, the, the department had just been founded, and we had rooms. It was wonderful. <laughs> okay, perhaps we can thank Keith again for his uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. <laughs>